Hi guys, welcome to this revision summary video looking at the entirety of topic 3, which is acids, alkalis and electrolysis. The aim for this video is to look at all the key things that you need to revise to get yourself ready for the exam. If you want to go into more detail on any particular part, I've put a link in the top right hand corner to the playlist which goes into each section of the video in more detail, including practice questions and the model answers for them. So this is just an overview, if you want more detail, have a look at the playlist in the top right hand corner. The first section of this video is going to have a look at what the difference between an acid and an alkali is and what makes something acidic and alkali. So the three main acids you need to know are HCl, which is hydrochloric acid, H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid, and HNO3, which is nitric acid. Now you'll notice the key thing about all three of these is that they've all got hydrogen in. And indeed it's that hydrogen ion, H plus ion, that makes something acidic. If we have a look at some alkalis, such as sodium hydroxide, which is NaOH, magnesium hydroxide, which is MgOH2, and aluminium hydroxide, which is AlOH3, again, you'll notice all three of these have something in common. They've all got OH, and it's the OH- ion that makes something alkali. You're also expected to know the pH of different acids and alkalis. So if I draw my pH scale here, you should remember that everything with a pH of less than 7 is acidic and everything more than 7 is alkali, leaving pH of 7 being neutral. Now, if you have a strong acid, that is going to be around pH 1 to 2. If you have a weaker acid, it's going to be between 3 and 6, and similar with your alkalis. So pH of 8 to around 10 is weak and 11 plus is strong. The second part of this video is going to have a look at all the different indicators and what colours they go in acids and alkalis. The first one we're going to look at is phenolphthalein. So if you take phenolphthalein and add it into an acid, that acid will stay colourless. Phenolphthalein itself is already colourless, so it stays the same. It's important not to say clear, because you can have something that's clear blue, clear red, it will be colourless. And then if you take it and put it into an alkali, it will go from colourless to pink. The second indicator we're going to have a look at is methyl orange. Now you can guess from the name methyl orange is orange and when we take it and we put it into an acid it goes from orange to red. If we take that same indicator and put it into an alkali it will go from orange to yellow. And the third and final indicator you need to know is litmus solution. Now litmus solution starts off purple if you take that and put it into an acid it will go red and if you take it and you put it into an alkali, it will go from purple to blue. The next part is going to have a look at the link between pH and concentration, in particular for your H plus ions. So if we go back to our pH scale, as we go from pH 7 all the way down to pH 1, the lower the pH, the higher the concentration of H plus ions. So you know something with pH 1 is going to have more H plus ions than something with a pH of 6. It's the same with your alkalis, as you go from 7 all the way up to 13, the higher the pH, the higher the concentration of your OH- ions. It's also important to remember at pH 7 there are no H plus ions, there are no OH- ions, it is just water, H2O. Now what they will ask you in the exam is, as the pH goes down by 1, what happens to the concentration of H plus ions? And the key thing is, Every time the pH decreases by 1, it becomes 10 times more concentrated. There are 10 times more H plus ions. If it goes down by 2, it's 10 times 10 more H plus ions, which comes out to 100 times more concentrated or 100 times more H plus ions. And that process continues. So for example, if we go from pH 6 to pH 2, so it's gone down by 4, you've got 4 lots of 10, so 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, which comes out to 10,000 times more concentrated or 10,000 times more H plus ions. Now the way you'll see that in a question could be something like how much more concentrated is acid rain, which has a pH of 2, compared to normal rainwater, which has a pH of 6. So all you do is you find out the difference in the pH, so what's it gone down by? 4, so that's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. Put that into your calculator, it comes out to 10,000. So it's 10,000 times more concentrated. It works the other way as well. 
So if you had a question that says how much less concentrated is ethanoic acid, pH 5, compared to nitric acid, pH 2, you go from pH 2 all the way up to pH 5. It's gone up by 3, so that's 10 times 10 times 10. So it's 1,000 times less concentrated. The next section of this video is going to have a look at the four terms dilute, concentrated, weak and strong. What you need to be able to do is take those terms, explain them and explain how we can make two different acids react the same way. So if we start off with the term dilute, if we have a dilute acid it means there aren't that many H plus ions in our solution. There are a few H plus particles. If I have a concentrated one however, I have a lot more. So I have more or lots of H plus particles. When we get onto weak and strong acids, if we start off with weak, for example, ethanoic acid, which has got the formula CH3COOH, when that goes into solution, it will dissociate or ionize only partially. So it splits into its ions and you're going to have very few H plus ions. When you have a strong acid, for example, hydrochloric acid, it fully ionizes. So it turns from HCl into your H plus and your Cl minus ions. So what that means is you have a lot more H plus ions in your solution. So they might give you a reaction. I've got here hydrochloric acid or ethanoic acid reacting with marble chip, and they're going to work out how much volume is produced in 30 seconds when they add the acid to the marble chip. And they'll give you some results. So for example, hydrochloric acid, our strong acid, is going to produce 20 mil of gas in 30 seconds. But our weak acid, ethanoic, is going to only produce 7 mil. And then they'll turn around and give you a question saying something like, how could you alter a reaction to produce the same volume of gas? And there are two options, two ways you can do it. First option being, change your weak acid. So what we do is we take that and we make it more concentrated. You can do that by evaporating off some of the water. You don't need to go into the specifics. Just say, make it more concentrated. If you do that, there are going to be more H plus ions. It's going to react faster. Therefore, it's going to produce more volume in the same amount of time. The second option is change your strong acid. And you can imagine you're going the other way. So instead of making it more concentrated, this time you're going to make it more dilute. So you take it, you dilute it down, therefore you're going to have less H plus ions, and therefore it's going to react slower. If it reacts slower, less gas is produced in 30 seconds. This section of the video is going to have a look at the difference between bases and alkalis. Nice and simple, if it's a base, it will neutralize an acid. So a base is anything that neutralizes an acid. Your ionic equation for that is where you have a H plus ion, it reacts with an OH minus ion, and it makes H2O. So when we say neutralizes, there are no ions left. It's just water, it is neutral. An alkali, however, is anything that neutralizes an acid and is soluble. So we say a soluble base. Soluble, you should remember, means it will dissolve. Okay, the next section is going to have a look at word equations involving acids. So there are three acids you need to know, which are HCl, H2SO4, and HNO3. You also need to know the salts produced. So we have three acids, as I said, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, and nitric acid. You need to remember that if it's hydrochloric acid, you will always get a chloride at the end of your salt. If it's sulfuric acid, you will always get a sulfate at the end of your salt. And if it's nitric acid, you will always get a nitrate. So to name your salt, all you have to do is take the name of the metal, remembering that the metals are on the left-hand side of the periodic table, as you can see in the top left here, and add the correct salt ending, which we just talked about. So for example, if you have magnesium and nitric acid, Magnesium is the name of your metal, and then nitric acid, as we said down below, that makes a nitrate. So your actual product, your salt, is going to be magnesium nitrate. You also need to know the byproduct. There are three situations you need to remember. If you have an oxide, water is produced as your byproduct. If you have a carbonate, you get carbon dioxide and water. And if you have nothing, so no oxide, no carbonate, you always get hydrogen given off. So for example, lithium oxide reacting with nitric acid, first thing you do is you realize you've got an oxide. If you have an oxide, it produces water, so that is your byproduct. 
If it's a carbonate, as we can see down below, your byproduct is carbon dioxide and water. And if there's nothing there, if it's just lithium and nitric acid, there's no oxide, there's no carbonate, you're going to get hydrogen given off. So let's piece it all together. So my first reaction, I've got sodium reacting with nitric acid. I've got nitric acid, that forms a nitrate. The name of my metal is sodium, therefore my product is sodium nitrate, and that is the name of my salt. There is nothing after the sodium, therefore I get hydrogen produced, and that is my word equation. Number two, lithium oxide and sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid makes a sulfate. My metal here is lithium, so what do I get? Lithium sulfate. This time I've got an oxide. If I've got an oxide, I'm going to get water produced. So my byproduct is water, and that's my equation complete. And finally, aluminium carbonate plus hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid, that makes a chloride. My metal is aluminium, so I have aluminium chloride. I've got a carbonate. Carbonate, remember, carbon dioxide and water. So my byproducts are carbon dioxide and water. And again, my word equation is complete. The next section is going to have a look at the test for the two gases from this topic, carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So if we start off with carbon dioxide, the first thing you need to do is take your gas and bubble it through lime water, as you can see here. If carbon dioxide is present, that lime water will go cloudy. Again, you can see that occurring in the video down below. If we move on to hydrogen, all you need with hydrogen is to take a lit splint, and if you've got hydrogen, you get a squeaky pop, as you can hear here. Right, the next section is quite a large one. This is all the practicals from this topic that you're expected to remember for the exam. There are four major practicals, two of which are core practicals, which are more likely to come up and be tested. The first one we're going to look at is the core practical of preparing copper sulfate from copper oxide and sulfuric acid. Now normally, when you get a question on this, they will tell you that the copper oxide is insoluble. That's the key word you're looking for. The second you see insoluble, you follow the steps I'm about to go through, which is mainly focusing on filtration. So the first thing you do is you add excess copper oxide into your warm sulfuric acid. We say excess, that means more than needed, and the reason we warm up the sulfuric acid is it speeds up the reaction and it makes sure it's fully reacted. The second step is to neutralize the acid, so keep adding in enough copper oxide until it's fully neutral, and then filter the mixture with the apparatus you can see here. What will happen is the copper oxide that is unreacted will stay in the filter paper, and your copper sulfate solution will move through into the conical flask below. The third step is crystallization. Now you should remember this from the states of matter topic. That is nice and simply evaporating off the water. So you heat the solution up, and it evaporates off the water, and that will leave your crystals behind. Now just a few things to note here. How do you know it's neutral? You can either use pH paper or a pH probe. That will tell you when your solution is neutral. And secondly, when we say heat the solution to evaporate the water, it's usually a good idea to only get rid of about half of it, and then leave it on the side to get rid of the rest of the water. If you leave it to cool, the rest of the water will evaporate off, and you'll get larger crystals. Practical number two is preparing a salt, so in this case sodium chloride, from sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. Now the key here is both sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid are soluble, and the step you need to use here is a titration. You can't use filtration because you have no solid to filter. The particles are too small, it'll just go straight through and everything will be collected in the conical flask. The other thing is the pH won't stop at pH 7. You'll take your acid with a pH of 1, You'll add it, the alkali in, your sodium hydroxide, and it will get up to pH 7, but then it will keep going. You won't know by looking at it when it is neutral. So if you keep adding it, it will become an alkali, unlike with the core practical I just talked about. So what do we know? What can we do to make sure we know it's neutral? And that is the titration steps. So number one, you take a burette. That's the large thing, as you can see on the right-hand side, and you fill it up to the zero mil line. Once you've done that, Measure out 10 mil of your sodium hydroxide. It doesn't need to be 10 mil, it could be 20, 25, whatever you want to put down in the exam, that's fine. Use a pipette, that's the equipment you need to use. 
and then add it to a conical flask. Now I've got a beaker down here, a conical flask or beaker, it doesn't matter. Step three, add your indicator. Now try and remember phenolphthalein. This is probably one of the better indicators. It gives you a clear sign of when it's finished reacting, when it's become neutral. Add it in and it will go pink straight away. Once you've done that, turn the tap and start to add in the acid to the alkali nice and slowly. And you're gonna do this until it goes colorless. The second it goes colorless, you turn the tap off. That's how much acid it takes to completely neutralize and make your solution pH seven. Once you've done that, repeat all those steps again. Take an average. Once you have your average, you then need to repeat it without the indicator. Reason for that being, it must be pure. If you have your indicator in there, your sodium chloride crystals will not be pure because you'll have phenolphthalein with them. So you must do it without an indicator. Once you've done that, use your crystallization technique. Place your sodium chloride solution into an evaporating basin, heat it, evaporate off about half the water, leave it to cool, and you'll get your sodium chloride crystals. Practical three, preparing a pure dry precipitate. So this one's asking you to make silver chloride from silver nitrate and sodium chloride. The second you see pure dry precipitate, the method is exactly the same and there are five key steps. The first one is to dissolve your solids. Now, that is only if they're solid. If it tells you there are already solutions, you don't put this first step in. Step two, you've now got your solutions of sodium chloride and silver nitrate, you need to mix them together so they react. So mix them and that's gonna make your precipitate. Number three, you've got to filter it. So you've now got your precipitate, but you've also got your other solution. So you've got to separate them. So filtration, your precipitate will stay up in the filter paper, which is what we want. And the other thing will go into your conical flask, which we don't need. Number four, it's going to be impure, your precipitate is. It's going to have some of the remaining solution left with it. If you leave it to dry, it will not be a pure dry precipitate. So what you have to do is you have to wash it with distilled water. You give it a rinse, that will remove any impurities. They will go through into the solution below. And then finally, number five, you need to leave it to dry. Nice and simple, five key words, which might get you five marks out of five in an exam. Dissolve, mix, filter, wash, dry. The final practical is investigating the change in pH when calcium hydroxide or calcium oxide is added to hydrochloric acid. So you need to know the steps again of how you can do this investigation. This is the second core practical, so it's highly likely to come up. So the first thing you want to do is measure out 50 centimeters cubed of your hydrochloric acid. Doesn't have to be 50 centimeters cubed, choose a volume. Add it to a conical flask or a beaker, it doesn't matter what. Step two, use pH paper or a pH probe to measure the pH of the acid. Step three, measure out 0.3 grams of calcium hydroxide or calcium oxide, and then add it to the hydrochloric acid. Stir it, make sure it's fully reacted. Once you've done that, remeasure the pH. You're gonna do these steps, steps three to six, until you've added around three grams, in other words, until the pH has gone high enough. You'll get some results that look like this, and you'll get a graph that looks like this. You can then use that graph to find out the exact mass that it became neutral. So you read across from pH seven, which is on neutral pH, and you go straight down, as you can see here from my graph, 2.1 grams is where it became neutral. The next part of this video is going to have a look at solubility rules. Do you know if something's soluble and can you predict if there is going to be a precipitate? So the first thing you need to be able to do is use this table and then you need to be able to try and learn it because it's not guaranteed they will give you this table in the exam. So the first column here, they are all soluble, which means they will dissolve. They will not form a precipitate. The second column, they are insoluble, which means they will form a precipitate if they appear in your reaction. So if I take a reaction, let's take silver nitrate and sodium chloride. The first thing you'll be asked to do is figure out what the products are and then tell me is there going to be a precipitate or not? So what you do is you have a look and you swap the endings around. So I start off with silver and I take the ending of the other chemical, 
which is chloride. So my first product is going to be silver chloride. You then do the same with the other one. So take your metal, sodium, take your other ending, nitrate. So my products are silver chloride and sodium nitrate. You now need to figure out if we've got a precipitate or not. So we're going to start off with nitrates. Now, as you can see from the table, all nitrates are soluble. So we know silver nitrate and sodium nitrate are both soluble. So the state symbol we can put in for them to prove that, to show that, is AQ, aqueous. The next thing we want to do is have a look at our chlorides. Now, you can see here, most chlorides are soluble, except for silver and lead. So we have a look back over here. I've got silver chloride. That is one of my ones that's insoluble. So that's insoluble. That's going to be my precipitate. So my state symbol will be S because it's a solid. All that's left now is my sodium chloride. Sodium isn't in the insoluble column. It's not silver. It's not lead. It's soluble. Therefore, sodium chloride is soluble and we can put aqueous. So my precipitate in this reaction is silver chloride. On to the second section of the chemical change topic then, which is focusing on electrolytic processes. So we're going to start off with what is electrolysis? Now the easiest place to start is the definition, which is the breaking up of a compound or electrolyte using electricity. Now if you can't remember what an electrolyte is, it's an ionic substance, any type of liquid that is molten or dissolved that contains ions that can conduct electricity. Now this always involves direct current. So if you take an example, NaCl, sodium chloride, you have two ions in there. You have Na plus and Cl minus. Therefore, it's an ionic substance. When we turn that into a liquid, so we either melt it or dissolve it, those ions become free to move. When they're free to move, it becomes an electrolyte. So now you know what electrolysis is, you need to know what happens to the ions during electrolysis. And to do that, you need to know the names of the two electrodes. The way I always say to remember that is remember the phrase panic. Positive, anode, negative is cathode. So if we take sodium chloride, which as we already said contains Na plus cations and Cl minus anions, opposites attract. So your positive cation is going to go to your negative cathode. Therefore, the opposite is going to occur with your anion. Your negative anion is going to move to your positive anode. Now when they get to those electrodes, they will turn back into their atoms or molecules. So if they're metals, it'll go from sodium ion to sodium metal. If it's chlorine, it'll turn back into a diatomic molecule. So Cl- will go to Cl2. You've got to remember, everything in group 7 is diatomic. Now we get on to the trickier stuff. In particular, what are the products of electrolysis? Now if you have a molten compound, so it's just been melted, it's nice and simple. You'll get the elements in there. So sodium chloride will make sodium and chlorine, iron oxide will make iron and oxygen, that's it. It becomes a bit more complicated though when you have something that's aqueous, which means it's dissolved in water. So if we go back to sodium chloride, which is now aqueous, it's going to have our Na plus iron, it's also going to have our chlorine minus iron, but it's also going to have H plus and OH minus. Those are the two ions that are found in water. So you guys need to be able to work out whether it's going to be the metal or the H plus ion, whether it's going to be the anion or the OH minus ion forming at the two electrodes. And there are a couple of rules to help work that out. So if we start off with the cations, the positive ions, nice and simply the least reactive ion will form and turn back into its atom or molecule. So for example, sodium chloride, you can either have Na plus or H plus turning back to normal, if you can remember, usually if it's in group 1, 2 or 3, it's highly reactive. If it's in the transition metals in the middle, it's less reactive. Therefore, in between is our H+. So if it's group 1, 2 or 3, H+, will form. If it's in the transition metals, they will form. So hydrogen will turn back into a H2 atom, remembering that hydrogen is also diatomic. The Na+, will stay in the solution. If we move on to the anions, Nice and simply, have you got a halide? If so, that will form, a halide being a halogen. So for example, sodium chloride, I've got a chlorine, that chlorine is a halide, therefore chlorine will go from Cl- to Cl2, again remembering it's diatomic. The OH- stays in the solution. So if we have a look at an example, copper sulfate, 
The cations are Cu2 plus and H plus, and the anions are SO4 2 minus and OH minus. So here, copper is in the transition metals, therefore it is less reactive than hydrogen, so that's going to form. So I'm going to get Cu2 plus going back to my copper metal. Out of the two anions, I don't have a halide, there's nothing in there from group 7. Therefore, my OH minus is going to form, and that, which you have to remember, turns back into H2O and O2. Second example, magnesium bromide. So you've got Mg2 plus, H plus, Br minus, and OH minus in your solution. Out of the two, magnesium's in group 2, so that is more reactive. Your H plus is less reactive, that's going to form. You've got a halide, which is bromine, so that is going to form. So your H plus turns back into H2, your Br minus turns back into Br2. Okay, on to the next section. In this part, we're going to have a look at how you can write half equations and how you can work out whether oxidation and reduction are occurring. Now, this only comes up in the higher paper, so if you're doing the foundation, the standard paper, skip past this section. Now, the best way to talk about how to do half equations is to have a look at some examples. So we're going to go all the way back and have a look at sodium chloride. And we're going to have a look at something that's molten. So there are no H+, no OH- ions. So I know I've got Na+, and Cl-. I know that sodium's in group 1, loses one electron, becomes Na+. Chlorine's in group 7, gains one electron, becomes Cl-. What happens during electrolysis then is that Na+, and Cl- go back to their original form. So at the cathode, Na+, will go back to Na, and at the anode, Cl- will go back to Cl2. Again, remembering it's diatomic. What this is missing, however, is the electrons. You've got to be able to add the electrons to show what's happening between it being Na plus and Na and 2Cl minus and Cl2. And the best way to work that out is to have a look at both the ionic and electronic configurations. So if you start off with the left hand side and draw out the Na ion, it's Na plus which means it's lost all its electrons. It's Na plus one which means it's only lost one electron. All metal ions are the same. If it's in group two, Mg2 plus and it would have lost two electrons. Then draw what the actual atom will look like. So sodium is in group one so it will have one electron on it. So how do you go from Na plus with nothing in the outer shell to Na with one electron in the outer shell? You add one electron. So you can see in my half equation here, I'm plussing one electron on the left hand side. Now during electrolysis, all metals gain electrons, therefore you'll always be adding electrons onto the left hand side of the equation. And we can do the same with our anions. So if we draw a chloride anion, it's got a full shell because they've gained electrons, and we have two of them. On the right hand side, I have my chlorine atom, which has lost an electron. Now that's going to become Cl2, it's going to become diatomic, but the key thing is it goes back to having lost that electron. So as you can see from my half equation, I'm going to put an electron on the right hand side. Now because I've got two chlorine ions, I've got to lose two electrons, so I put plus 2e minus on the right hand side. Let's have a look at an aqueous solution now. So I've got sodium sulfate, which contains Na+, H+, SO4, 2- and OH- ions. Hydrogen is less reactive, so it's going to go from H+, to H2. So I'm going to need two H+, ions to form my H2 diatomic molecule. If it's H+, it means it's lost electrons. And hydrogen atom, you can see from your periodic table, only contains one electron. Now we've got two of both of these, so just remember that. Therefore, to go from my H plus to my H, I need to add one electron. Because I've got two hydrogens and it becomes H2, I need to add two electrons, one for each. So my half equation will be 2H plus plus 2E minus goes to H2. At the anode, I have no halide. Therefore, my OH minus is going to turn into H2O and O2. Now at this stage, what you need to do is you need to balance it. So work out and make sure you've got the same number of oxygens and hydrogens on either side. So once you've done that, you can see I've got 4 OH- minus goes to O2 plus 2 H2O. Now the key to working out the number of electrons that are lost, look at the charge. I've got OH-, minus, which means that's got one extra electron on it. So what I need to do is I need to take that electron away. But because it's balanced, I have four OH- molecules. 
Therefore, I need to lose four electrons, so I put plus four E minus on the right hand side. So the key thing is, all metals will gain electrons, so all your cations gain electrons, so you'll be plusing the electrons on the left hand side of the arrow. All non-metals lose electrons, so all your anions lose electrons, and therefore, on the right hand side is where you'll get your electrons. And then the final little bit from this section, how do you know whether oxidation or reduction is occurring? Remember, oil rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain. Therefore, all anions have lost electrons, therefore all anions are oxidized. And all cations are reduced, all cations have gained electrons. Right, on to the final section of the electrolysis video. The core practical. How can you purify copper using copper sulfate? The first thing you need to do for this practical is learn the steps. So number one, we take some copper electrodes and we clean them. The reason that we're using copper electrodes is they will change in mass. And what we can do is we can take dirty, impure copper and purify it. If you were to use inert or graphite electrodes, they won't take part of the reaction. So because they don't change in mass, they don't take part in the reaction, normal electrolysis occurs. You've got copper 2 plus ions, you've got H plus ions, you've got SO4 2 minus ions, and you've got OH minus ions. Copper is less reactive, so that will form. So at your cathode, you will get your copper forming, and at your anode, there's no halide, so you'll get oxygen and you'll get water forming. But we're talking about this copper practical, we're talking about using copper electrodes. So let's forget all that. So we've cleaned our copper electrodes. We then need to measure the mass and label one anode and one cathode. The next thing is we want to get a variable resistor and we want to make sure the current is set to 0.2 amps. Now a variable resistor is something that keeps the current constant. So it doesn't matter if it's 0.2, 0.4, it will keep it at that current. Number four, Add your copper sulfate solution and then turn the power pack on. Start your stopwatch and then after two minutes, stop it, dry the electrodes and re-weigh. At this point you'll notice there has been a change in mass. What you can then do is you can do it at different currents and you can see how changing the current affects the change in mass. So the second part of this core practical is you need to be able to explain what happens. So if we start off with our impure anode. We have taken our impure anode, which has got copper in there, which is impure, and the copper there, as soon as you turn the power on, will turn into copper 2 plus ions and move into the solution. They are then positive ions and they will move to your negative cathode. When they get to the cathode, they will gain electrons and they will turn back into copper. So if you remember, oil rig oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. They are reduced at the cathode and turn back into copper atoms. So therefore, the mass of your anode is going to decrease. So for example, it may have gone down by 0.7 grams. I've just made that value up. And your cathode is going to increase. So for example, it could go up by 0.65 grams. Now it's important to note that the difference will not be the same. And you'll usually find that the cathode will not go up by as much as the anode has gone down by. And there's a reason for that. You're gonna have your impurities, your sludge forming. When you have your impurities, they will break off and it will fall down and be collected at the bottom of the actual beaker. And then if you increase the current, finally, you'll increase the change in mass. So the higher the current, more mass loss and more mass gained. And that really is everything there is to the electrolysis topic and therefore the chemical change topic. Again, if you need more information, if you feel as though part of this has gone through too quickly, have a look at my individual videos. There's one for every single outcome in the playlist in the top right hand corner. That brings this video to an end. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please click on like down below. You can also subscribe to my channel, you can check out the latest video, and you can visit my website up above here. Bye now.